Today is our communion service, and we are glad you're here to partake with us. And because it's communion service, we will have a brief message. It won't be so long. That's my dear wife would like to know. <laughs> so our message is entitled, Till He Comes. Till He Comes. And it is taken from the, the, the passage, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us explore that in a brief interlude before we separate. And I will say before we, I begin, after the message, we won't have a closing hymn. We will separate for the ordinance of foot washing, and then we will return for the communion service. And then after that is done, we will have our closing hymn. And if you are visiting and you don't know about foot washing, it's in the Bible. If you have encountered a church that doesn't do it, we can point you to where it is in the Bible. But let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your care. And now, Lord, as we come to look briefly at what Jesus was saying and why he said it, I pray Oh, Lord, that we will get the understanding and that we will do what is required of us. May your spirit, therefore, teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the apostle was writing to the Corinthian church that had a lot of problems. And he told them, when you partake of this service, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Jesus himself knew that he was going to die. But he told them to partake of this service that he instituted. We call it the Last Supper because it was the Last Supper before his crucifixion. We call it the Lord's Supper and we call it Holy Communion or Communion Service. Some churches even have another name which some people don't like to hear. But Jesus says, do this often, and you're going to remember me. Why should we even remember what Jesus did? And how should we conduct ourselves? Well, Jesus knew he was going to come back. At that service, in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, when he told the disciples that he was going away and they were sorrowful, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus promised to go and then to return. But before he went, he was going to die. Many times we have communion service and we focus on the cross, which is the most important thing. But we forget that the communion service also focuses on the second return of Jesus. It makes no sense Jesus dies and then vanishes. And what Jesus did was that he died, he spent some time in the grave, he rose, met with his disciples a little bit, and he went to heaven. And then he promised that he was going to return. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, when the angels saw the disciples looking up as Jesus was going up, he says, Men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you to heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus died to redeem us. Jesus died to purchase us back. We were lost 
through transgression. And Jesus is coming again. Amen. Jesus died to save us from our sins. Jesus did not die to save us in our sins. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are basically saying, you know what, we want to be part of Jesus' body. The Bible tells us that Christ is the head of the church and we are his body. And symbolically, the bread that we partake of is called the body of Christ. Symbolically, it's not literally the body, as some people mention their hocus pocus over the bread and call it the body. It's not. And similarly, the grape juice that we drink is not alcoholic wine. And just as a side note, Jesus had no sin in him. So, so the bread that represents his body had no yeast or leaven. It was unleavened bread. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you have one bit of sin in your body, the whole of you is sinful. And sin could not be a part of Christ's body. So unleavened bread is the only bread that could represent his body. Likewise, alcoholic juice could not represent his blood because it is fermented. So when you go to some places and they give you alcohol to drink, they are giving you a gross distortion of the blood of Christ. It has to be pure, sin-free. And by the way, the Bible uses wine for both grape juice and alcoholic grapes juice, which is wine. So we don't use the alcohol and we don't use leaven or yeast in any emblems that represent the Lord's body or blood. Just wanted you to know that. So God said he sent his son to die for our sins to save us from our sins. And when Jesus is returning he is coming for a people not to any more save them from sins. They should have been delivered already and should be living a holy life. Not that we have overcome everything at once, but we are on the Christian pathway. And as I was doing my devotions, you know, recently all my sermons come from, sermons come from my devotions. I was going through the book of 1 Thessalonians and Bill actually mentioned it in his prayer. I don't know how he knew. I realized that First Thessalonians could be called the gospel of the second coming. Uh, in First Thessalonians, Paul wrote to the people. And he was saying to them in chapter 1, verse 10, you be, verse 7, you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. So they were good evangelists. They believed and then they were sounding forth the word. And in verse 9, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So the Thessalonians turned to God to serve the living and true God. And then verse 10 says, And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. So until Jesus comes, point number one, we are to turn from idols. We are to turn to the true and living God. Amen. Idolatry is not just bowing down to some little carved statues. The Bible says covetousness is idolatry. If we value somebody's word over God's word, that person is our idol. Idolatry is wide and deep. We can't look into that today. But one, when Jesus says we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, he expects us to flee from idolatry. Then when I go into the second chapter of Thessalonians, and he, Paul was now writing in verse 14, you brethren became imitators of the churches of God, 
which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Judeans. The Thessalonians were persecuted because they became Christians. And then he said, verse 17, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Paul loved these people because of all of what they did, they demonstrated when they became Christians. And he longed to see them. And then in verse 18, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. But then notice what he finished in verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Again, the second chapter says that at the coming of Jesus, there is going to be a great rejoicing between brethren when they see their brethren saved. You know, we want to take from this point that when we are looking for Jesus to come, we must be encouraging one another. As Paul is encouraging them, we must rejoice when they walk the Christian's pathway. We must be encouraged and be encouraging. We must have joy and comfort and hope in our brethren as we wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even when Jesus comes, it will be even a greater rejoicing. Then let's go on to chapter 3. I'm just giving you some nuggets of what I noticed in First Thessalonians and 2nd. I won't go into the 2nd. That this is a book about till he comes. Now, in 2nd, in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Paul wanted to go back to these, his children, to strengthen them. They didn't learn everything. They probably were faltering under the persecutions. And he wanted to strengthen their faith. And his prayer is in verse 12, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. There is a good reason for that. Notice verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our Lord God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his sins. Stay here again, Paul refers to the coming of Jesus. But we should be what? Blameless in holiness. Because we should have been abounding in love to one another. Everything that we do to each other should be done in love. So be done that we are not blamed for any wrong things done to our brethren in the church. We shouldn't be the persecutors. We shouldn't be the ones that lead them to idolatry. We shouldn't be the ones that lead them into any wrong acts. But instead, the love should cause their hearts to be so filled with love for each other and for the love of Christ that when Jesus comes, he will be so happy to see them. And verse chapter 4 now, they were carefully looking after their brethren. And they thought somehow that Jesus was going to come back in their time. But one by one, some of their brethren were falling asleep. And by the way, in case you don't know, the Bible speaks of death as a sleep. The brethren were dying and they started to sorrow. What is going to happen to them when Jesus comes? Are we going to go to heaven and all our stalwart brethren who have gone to sleep? What will they do? Where will they go? Where will they end up? Will they not share in the joys, the blessed hope? So the apostle wrote to them in chapter 4, verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. They were very sorrowful. Some of us, our 
family members and our friends have died. And we weep and we sorrow and we grieve, which we should because we are connected. But if they die in Jesus, we shouldn't sorrow as those who have no hope. We should still sorrow, but there is a bit of rejoicing if they died in Christ. Notice what the apostle says. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now some people interpret this to mean God will bring them from heaven. But no, that's not what scripture is saying. He's actually quoting the Old Testament that by God, he will raise them up with thee. When Christ died and rose, he, when we die and rise, he's bringing us with him from the grave. Notice how he, he said in verse 15, for this we say, he's giving an explanation to you by the word of the Lord that we were alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. They're asleep. They're not in heaven having a grand time. They are asleep. When Jesus went to the grave of Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, our friend, sleeps. The person says, well, Lord, if he's sleeping, he does well. He was sick. Give him a chance. Let him rest. And then Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. The Bible says, all of us sleep. It's an unconscious sleep. Then he now gives the explanation. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. He didn't say the dead in Christ will come down from heaven. Will rise first. This is the loudest passage in the Bible. A shout. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. When Jesus shouted at Lazarus' grave, Lazarus, come. If Jesus just said, come forth, everybody would come forth. When Jesus died, he gave a shout. And the Bible says there was a great earthquake in Matthew 27, 51. All the graves were open and the bodies of the saints came out. Those who were there. They didn't come down from heaven. They didn't come out of hell. They were in the graves and they came out. Matthew 27, 51. You can check that. And so the Lord comes and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So look, brethren, don't worry about your brethren who have died. Jesus is going to call them from the grave. In Revelation 1 verse 18, Jesus says, I have the key to death and the grave. Why did Jesus have the key? Because he died. He died and he ripped the key out of the hands of the devil. Who had persecuted all humanity with death. Jesus said, I have the key. I was dead and I am alive forevermore. And all those who believe in me, I will resurrect from the clutches of the grave. And in verse chapter 5, he said, concerning the times, I don't need to tell you, I've told you before. He says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Those who are not looking, those who are not expecting Jesus will be horribly surprised. But you, brethren, he says, are not like those who are asleep. You watch. You wait. So another key takeaway is that when we are expecting and when we are showing the Lord's death till he comes, we should be watching. We should be watching. We should be waiting. We should be encouraged that even if our loved ones die, they will be resurrected from the grave. We must turn from idols. We must live holy and blameless lives. So when we come to the communion table and we partake, we are showing the Lord's death till he comes. These are just some of the things that we should consider until he comes. 
I pray, therefore, that as we think on these things, we will want to show the Lord's death till he comes by a life of watching, of waiting, of holy conduct, of blameless living, of rejoicing and looking for the hope that even those of us who have felt the cold sting of death will be rescued from the grave. I pray that by God's grace, every one of us will be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your care. And we pray, Lord, that all of us will want to be a part of your kingdom. We want to go home with Jesus and we will be ready. Whether we go to the grave or we remain alive, that we will be ready when Jesus comes. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So at this time,